Hello, thank you for all, all for coming. Uh, my name is Jamie Hayden. I'm the managing director of the uh, imaging core resource or imaging shared resource at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia. I've been doing um, imaging uh, for many, many years and uh, the microscopy element of it has really changed over time. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor, the kind of thing that I deal with on kind of a regular basis. Anyway, let's jump right into it. We talked about multidimensional, so what does multidimensional mean? Let's start at the beginning. You all know what 2D is, right? 2D is flat land, and you're dealing essentially with a monochrome image or an RGB image like the one on the right there, uh, which is still a one-shot uh, deal. That's the idea. But you're dealing with a two-dimensional plane, X, Y. Fairly straightforward. Add the third dimension, so we're dealing with what we call stacks. Uh, lots of times we're dealing with uh, taking confocal uh, slices, going through a section and then creating some kind of a three-dimensional reconstruction of our, of our images. Um, so that would be the third dimension. Okay, fourth dimension, time. Wonderful thing. So time lapse becomes very important when we're dealing with cancer research because if you're looking at a single time point, Fixed cells don't tell you what's about to happen or what happened just a second ago. It's the interactions where all the data is taking place, and it's the interactions that we're trying to capture. So this is a, a comparison of wound assays with uh, uh, different conditions. Uh, the first time it went through, you can see that one went through faster than the other, and you need to quantify that information. It's not just a question of looking at it and seeing if it does it. It's, it's giving numbers to what you see. So that's 4D. 5D, what's 5D? Well, we've been seeing these beautiful multicolor images, including my Thanksgiving shot. Um, but it's basically when you have more than one channel uh, that you're dealing with. So we're capturing things in multiple channels. Uh, one of them might be a bright field one. Uh, the other ones are generally, uh, generally fluorescence. We do a lot of fluorescence. We'll talk mostly about that today. Um, so if you're dealing with more than one channel, you're dealing in 5D. What's 60? 60 is fairly straightforward. It's just doing the same thing over and over in different places. So essentially what you have is the uh, the time lapse being set up at one position, moving to another one doing the same stack there, going to another place doing the stack there, coming back to the first one and waiting to get the second time point and then doing that all over again. So 6D imaging includes all of those things, all interacting, all being very interconnected and that's where the complexity comes in. Because any one problem in any one of these things is going to create a, pro a problem with your final product. So the talks will bounce around a little bit because because it's not linear. You can have things like 2D sequences in multiple locations. That's not exactly 3D, is it? But it is three different dimensions if you look at it that way. 3D acquisition in, in two or three wavelengths, 2D time lapse, and anyway, you get the idea. So lots of different combinations of Ds, um, but any problem in any one, that's going to give us uh, issues. So let's start with the basics. What are the overall challenges? Well, we're photographers, image quality, right? The biggest issue actually, well, I'm gonna say that a lot. The biggest issue is, they're all big issues. We as photographers look at an image and we think, okay, we need it to get you need to get the best image out of this thing, the highest quality, the best information. That's what we're aiming for. Going in as a photographer into this field, that's the way I first looked at things. The reality is the scientific view is very different. The scientific view is more, is it good enough? Can I see the data that I'm looking for? Those of you in the front might be able to easily see there's a huge difference between the image on the right, which is nice and smooth and clear, and the image on the left, which is very grainy and noisy and you can't see much. Those of you in the back may not even be able to see that difference. Maybe you can. But I bet even those of you in the back can see the blue nucleus in the middle, and you can still see that there's green striations for the microtubules, and you can still see some red mitochondria. And if that's all you need to see, then you can compromise on all your imaging parameters and take the image on the left and do some post-processing with deconvolution and things like that to be able to get the image on the left looking like the image on the right and you can pull the data out of it. So looking at it from the scientific view is very different than looking at it from um, the photographic point of view. And we're making constant compromises when we get this as you'll see towards the end. Um, 
Second overall challenge, labeling. We're looking at things. We need to know what we're looking at. So we need to somehow label it so that we know that what we are looking at is indeed what we think it is. And that can be a big particular problem. Most of what we're labeling with is fluorescence. And most of what we're dealing with with fluorescence is immunolabeling. So you're essentially attaching a fluorophore to some sort of a, an antibody antigen type of a complex, which is connecting to, you name it. Um, they're, uh, they're designed to look at you know, nuclei, mitochondria, microtubules, endosomes, uh, you name it, whatever. So you have different combinations of things that you're going to be labeling and then running your experiments off of those but all the pretty colors come from that. What's the other thing? Speed. When you're dealing with 4D, you're dealing with time. And when you're dealing with time, as you all know, things move. And when they move and we want to capture them, we have all kinds of issues. Sometimes they're moving very slowly. Sometimes they're moving very fast. The ones on the right are moving very, very fast, but they're very, very small. And that combination creates all kinds of problems for us. I guess in the end, really, the main issue is sample integrity. The biggest, all right, see, I'm saying it again. One of the biggest problems that we run into is that in the process of imaging our cells, they die, all right? Um, or something else happens to them that's an effect from our imaging process. So we need to get through this entire process without killing the cells or uh, changing the fluorescence or changing the results in any way from our outside interference. That's really the issue. There's a lot of other things in there as well, you know, additional things in post acquisition, tracking, all the analysis that we want to do. Here's a good one. How do you present three dimensional information in two dimensions? This screen is two dimensions, right? And I'm going to be showing you three-dimensional information. How do I show it? That can actually be a very challenging problem. Anyway, to begin with, let's start with your question. That's always the best place to start. Experimental design, you hope that the researcher who's doing this stuff is going to come to you first and say, OK, here's what I want to do. How do we approach it? So you start with whatever your scientific question is. And whatever that question is is going to then dictate what equipment, what choices you have, and how to uh, capture the information in the first place. You really need to understand your subject. How many people do wildlife photography and want to go out and say, I want to capture an image of a white-eyed vireo on the nest? Well, you need to know where they nest. You need to know how to find one. You need to know the sound. You need to know that. Same thing in this. You know, I need to know how the cells are going to react when I look at them. I need to know how they're going to react under certain environmental conditions. So you need to know your biological samples. You need to know what your, well, we all know what our cameras can do. You need to know what your microscope can do as well. Um, you need to know what you might be able to do at the end. That issue that I was talking about with deconvolution, taking a really noisy image and turning it into a very good one at the end. If I know I can do that, then I have other choices at the beginning that I can choose from and, and make life easier. Um, anyway, bottom line is you need to know what your final product is going to be, what your final needs are going to be, so that you can set up and design your experiment in a way to make it happen. All right, so first question, pretty basic. What microscope am I going to use? Well, in order to answer that question, I have some questions for you first. So um, what's your sample? Is it in a dish? Is it on a slide? Is it live? Is it fixed, attached, floating, 3D? You name it. Is it stained? Is it not stained? You know, those are going to give us different issues. Do I need to take it with a color camera, one shot thing? Can I do it with monochrome and build it up? Do you need 3D info? All of these things have to be addressed at the very beginning. Once you get an idea of that, you can decide, OK, I'm going to use the, uh, the wide field inverted scope or the upright over here or the two photon in the bottom right or one of my two confocals in the middle. Depending on what you need to see, uh, you know, it's going to uh, dictate which way we go. How do you need to see it, really? High mag? If you're doing high mag, you might be uh, dealing with the confocals and uh, immersion lenses and things like that. Low mag, you could do it with a wide field system. Are you looking for cell interaction? Or are you just looking for general morphology and movement? Are you looking for quantitative results uh, versus qualitative results? If something is just moving around and you're watching it move, interesting. Uh, but if you're trying to quantify that information and give numbers to it, that's a whole other ball of wax. All right, again, basics. Fixed slide. Somebody comes, I got a slide, I got to take an H&E picture. Which one would you like to use on the right, the top one or the bottom one? 
All right. So it goes back to the very basics of microscopy. Um, you know, if we're going to be doing a slide, do I need to do it on an upright scope or an inverted? Well, luckily for you, on a slide, you can do it on either. So it doesn't really matter which scope you've got. But you do need a color camera to do an H&E, &E, so that's good. Clean slides, everything has to be clean. How many people have glasses? I see lots of reflections. By the end of the day, what do your glasses look like, right? Um, but the camera is always going to see whatever's on there. So everything has to be cleaned at all times. Kohler illumination, how many people have heard of Kohler illumination? Yeah. All right, how about if I pronounce it correctly? Curler illumination. Yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, most people have never heard of that uh, who use the microscopes, and that's part of my training. Um, cover slips, all right? You might not even think about this. Even if you don't cover, slips your, cover slip your own slides, Cover slips come in a variety of flavors. Number ones, one and a halfs, and twos. And somebody in the lab ordering the cover slips doesn't know the difference. One and a halfs are 0.17 millimeters thick. Number twos are 0.22. And if you're doing high magnification without a correction collar, then what you're going to run into is fuzzy, blurry pictures because the uh, lenses are corrected for 0.17, not 0.22. But if you don't know that, you're not going to get good pictures. Um, as I said, the correction collar at the bottom, uh, you know, can correct for that. Are you using oil? Are you doing your white balance properly? Proper exposure? All these basic, basic, basic things are just the beginning of the multidimensional process. All right, let's get into some maybe some live cells. Somebody's coming with live cells. There's different kinds of dishes. A little 35 millimeter dish on the left, a multi-well plate on the right. That's fine. They come in plates, flasks, chamber slides, all kinds of things. Generally, those have to be looked at on an inverted scope. Okay, good. Inverted scope needs long working distance lenses because the thickness of the plastic underneath is so much that you're going to hit it with a regular lens. So you need to have the special kind of lenses. But if you want high magnification, you can't do it with those. You need to use glass bottom dishes. So if somebody designs their entire experiment, brings me cells and dishes and say, I want to use 63X on the confocal, and I'm looking at it and it's a plastic bottom dish, it's like, uh, we can't do it, but I just spent two weeks growing those cells. Well, you're going to have to go back and grow them from two, for two more weeks. It would be good to talk to me at the beginning of the process. All right, if I got live cells, we need to keep them alive. We need to keep them happy, so you're dealing with environmental controls. Environmental controls can be kind of two flavors. The one on the left is a staged top, staged top control, and the one on the right encloses the entire microscope. The basic things that we're looking for are heat control, CO2 control, humidity, and light. Occasionally, we have people that want to do hypoxic experiments uh, where you're lowering the oxygen levels. And for that, I really need the one on the left, which can push out oxygen um, with nitrogen. So it's a three gas thing. You have these different combinations. And uh, depending on what you need to do, you might use one or the other. So if you've got live cells in dishes and they are not stained and you want to look at them, how do you look at them? Well, phase contrast is the uh, way of choice, but it just so happens on my confocal scopes, I don't have phase lenses. I have DIC lenses, so I can do it with DIC. What did I say before about plastic dishes? Anybody who knows DIC may, might know that you can't do DIC through plastic. So if you've got a plastic lid, you can't do DIC. It won't work. So you have to, again, know that in advance. But these are some of the things that we have to deal with. All right, let's take a quick, well, this will be a little bit longer look at uh, fluorescence labeling because I need you to understand a few things before we move on. There are issues with fluorescent labeling. Um, you want to match your probes to the hardware you've got. Somebody comes in and says, I've got these cells. They're labeled with CFP and YFP. Let's use the SP8. Oh, guess what? I can't because I don't have a laser that will excite CFP on that particular one. I got to use the other scope. And that means I got to use another kind of dish. And that means I have another type of envir environmental control. It all ties together. Maybe I don't have the right filter cubes. Anyway, there's different kinds of dyes. I mean, labeling that I mentioned before, there's live dead combinations that you can work with. There, you can see them if they're live. You don't if they're dead or they change color. The big issue with any dye is it can also be toxic. So you can wind up killing your cells by labeling your cells, and that's a problem as well. So they invented several years ago, and they got the Nobel Prize for 
uh, green fluorescent protein, which is now all kinds of colors of proteins, which are, can be incorporated into the cell instead of external labeling with dyes. The fluorescent proteins are a, vi a viral transfection most of the time and create a stable expression. But they're generally non-toxic. I mean, if you've got brown hair, that doesn't kill you, right? Uh, if you've got blonde hair, it doesn't kill you either. It's part of your genome, so that's, uh, that works better. Uh, sometimes you can run and use things like the second harmonic signal, which is not labeling at all. So with fluorescence, you're essentially, one thing to remember, you're seeing these pretty colors. You're seeing reds and greens and blues, or as I mentioned in InfoShare, cyan, magenta, and yellow. Um, but what you're really doing is you're taking your fluorescent image in monochrome. You're taking, you're exciting it with one color, you're emitting in another color, and you're using a black and white detector to see specific wavelengths. What color we make them <coughs> excuse me, is, um, is independent. You see them like you see on the screen right now, and you're only seeing one channel at a time, one bit of information at a time. Afterwards, you're going to add a color lookup table to it, and that's where the color comes from. And you don't actually see the final product until you bring all of those together in the software. Uh, now, where do the colors come from? Basic idea in fluorescence, what you have is an excitation curve, which is the dotted line on the left, and an emission curve, which is a solid one on the right. You have a dye, every dye is different. They're going to excite with one color, generally a lower wavelength, and they're going to emit at a higher wavelength. And that's, for most things, the standard. The Stokes shift is the difference between the two peaks. All right, I don't need you to really look at this and understand it if you don't, but if you're going to be doing these kind of experiments, you do need to understand these. You need to get really good with trying to figure out how all these curves work. The only thing I really want to point out here is this area right in here, where you can see I've got uh, my green emission for 488, which is Alexa dye, and DAPI, which is the blue. Notice that the blue bleeds completely into the 488, and essentially, I'm going to show you an example next um, that's going to show you why that's a particular problem. So this is called overlap. If I try to image both of these together, the blue and the green, the DAPI and the microtubules, the Alexa 488, what's going to happen is the uh, wavelengths, the emissions for the DAPI are going to emit way, way up into the green area. And the detector underneath is going to be seeing that signal. It's not going to see blue or green, it's going to see signal only. That's all it cares about. It's a black and white detector. And so what I'm seeing down here is I'm seeing not only my microtubules from the 488, but I'm also seeing the bleed through from the DAPI. So the way we get rid of that is we do them separately. So this is a simultaneous acquisition and this is a sequential one. Over here we do the DAPI by itself and then we do the 488 by itself and you can see that you don't have that bleed through. The problem with this, it takes time and that you're going to see in a few minutes is a big problem. So in the final image at the bottom you can see we did a combination of those things. We still have to do the DAPI by itself but we can do the microtubules and the, um, and the uh, mitochondria separate or together and do it so like one and two instead of one one and one which would take even longer all right when we're dealing with fluorescence we're dealing with these three basic problems bleaching or fading uh, phototoxicity and autofluorescence so with bleaching there's not a lot you can do if they're fixed cells you can use anti-fade uh, mounting medias which helps reduce some of the bleaching but for the most part, really the only way to control it is to reduce the intensity of the light or the amount of light overall. Um, for, uh, so the, the amount overall can also be taken care of with fewer scans. We'll get to that in a bit too. Phototoxicity. Uh, as I said, you know, we're dealing with uh, things that can kill our cells, so we have to be careful about what we're using. In general, lower wavelengths are not happy for cells. They don't like ultraviolet light looking at them. It kills them. So if you can use infrared, or if you can use farther red uh, at least, that's going to be happier for the cells. Uh, infrared also penetrates more. Uh, as uh, we'll probably hear a little bit later, but uh, uh, that also is very helpful. Autofluorescence is a particular problem because it emits right in the same range as some of the, the basic green dyes that we use for everything, either the GFP or the FITSI, Alexa 488. All those green ones are right around emitting around the 500 to 525 nanometer range, and that's exactly where autofluorescence is at its worst. So if you can get around that and not use those, that'll help you as well. But sometimes you can actually use autofluorescence to your advantage. The reason I have this picture up here is because
because this fluorescent image that you see up here is all autofluorescence. All right, it's a fluorescent image, but I took advantage of the autofluorescence to make the image. Just a quick look at the bleaching to quantify what I was talking about. On the left, we have our image after four scans. So four scans is, is one frame uh, in, in the confocal. And so this is essentially time zero over on the left, so that's 100% in of, of the uh, signal. If we're using a 5% intensity laser over 100 scans, it barely registers. So we're not losing very much intensity over time. Compare that down to the 20% intensity laser we're doing down there, and you can see we're losing almost 35% of the light after only 100 scans. So if you can keep the laser intensities down, you can control the bleaching somewhat for a longer period of time. All right, I mentioned speed before, and I don't have to read all this stuff, but again, speed, speed, speed. How fast can you take your picture? How fast do you need to take your picture? These are the questions. What do we have to work with? We have the speed of the scanner. A lot of what I'm talking about, by the way, is going to really apply more to confocal than anything else. So, um, we have the speed of the scanner. A resonant scanner can go 8,000 hertz. That's 8,000 lines per second. If you don't have a resonant scanner, maybe the top is going to be 1,000 or 1,400. A good individual image, uh, quality image, might be at 700. Uh, so you're looking at 10 times faster using the resonance scanner. Uh, how many Z sections, that stack of images, how many sections are you going to take? Uh, if you do fewer, you can go do it faster. Uh, format, how big is my image? 512 by 512 is going to take half the amount of time that 1024 by 1024 will. Uh, number of frame averages, um, reduces noise but takes longer, um, line accumulations, simultaneous, sequential, all those things. But really, in the end, how fast of an interval do you need? If you're looking at something that happens very quickly um, and all these other things take a lot of time, you're going to have to compromise someplace. I got some examples. How long is your movie going to be? Is it going to be 15 minutes or is it going to be three days? That's going to affect how you're going to approach things. And then the multipoint is going to depend basically on how many areas you can visit during the time that your interval uh, has to be. So again, don't look at this next one too closely, but this is part of the 747 panel that I have to deal with when I'm making all of my choices. So I'm looking at things like you know the, the uh, uh, scanner speed over here, the format there, the averages down there. Uh, these are the stacks for the, uh, for the Z steps. It's a 34, 34 and a half micron step we're doing, or uh, stack. We're doing half micron steps which is going to give us 70 slices. That's going to take a while to go through 70 slices. We're going through five different areas. But really, the main number to look at is the one down there, which says to do everything that I want to do over here to get my beautiful, beautiful quality images, it's going to take 51 minutes to do all of those images. OK, well, that's not going to do very much if I need to do two second intervals, is it? So somehow you need to figure out where you can compromise and knock things back. Very simple sometimes. If I'm shooting at 700 hertz, if I go to 1400 hertz, I just cut that time in half. If I'm doing six frame averages, I go to three averages, I'm cutting that time in half. Uh, and then lots of other choices as you go down through to compromise on your final product. Things are moving. Those are mitochondria. I'll talk about those in a second. So when you're talking about your area of interest and how fast it's moving, you can look at it in basically three ways. Slow, uh, things that take place over minutes or hours. So a three-day movie, for instance, where they're barely crawling along. Uh, something like cell division, which happens fairly quickly. Uh, and you might want to see it in seconds to minutes, depending on what you're looking at. Or things like this up here with the mitochondria or gene, or gene loci, which are really fast and you have to look at in seconds or less. Um, and you need the high magnifications to be able to do it. This is every two seconds, the one thing that we're looking up here for 15 minutes. So that's, that's how quick those things are moving. Mitochondria move like little wiggly worms. It amazes me how quickly they are moving. All right. 
So we all know with our cameras that the subject can be moving or the camera can be moving. Well, it's the same thing here. The subject can be moving and we have to capture that, but my equipment can be moving too and screwing me up as well. Things, uh, one of the major things is Z-drift. So the stage is actually settling down on me and my cells are going out of focus while I'm trying to do it. It usually isn't a problem in 15 minutes, but it can always be a problem over days. Um, stage backlash is a fun one as you're doing the multi-point going around. If you go clockwise, you get one effect, and if you go counterclockwise, you get a different effect uh, because it's the way the, uh, the stage is created and you've got these little backlash with these screws that are in there. Um, so you can wind up with all this jiggling in your final, final images. So here's just a couple of examples on the left. Here's another problem. Hmm. They're gone, bye. Oh, look, are those the same ones that came back? I don't know, all right? If I want to be able to image or, or quantify the intensity of the red in those on the left, I don't even know if I'm looking at the same cells at the end. So if they're highly uh, moving, that's a problem. I can't do high magnifications. I got to do lower magnifications. The one on the right is a little, uh, little blurry in a couple of ways, both from the compression, but mainly you notice that the, the, by the end they've gone out of focus. Now, how far have these gone out of focus? Maybe 10 microns? That's all it takes. All right. So how do you control things like that? Uh, the main thing for Z-Drift, uh, there's two things really. One is to standardize the uh, temperature of the stage, actually everything including the stage. You don't want it to, uh, to heat up or cool down while you're imaging because as it heats up and cools down, metal expands and contracts by a couple of microns, everything goes out of focus. Uh, the other way to do it is to have, if you have the money for it, uh, some of these uh, products with the scopes uh, like adaptive focus control or perfect focus, which essentially pings a laser off the bottom constantly and can bring you back to the same point again if it starts to drift out. So when we're looking at those environmental controls, uh, as I said, the first thing to choose is am I doing it on the stage or am I doing it across the entire microscope? And when you're looking at your, uh, at your dishes themselves, which are down here, you can, you know, you're basically dealing with some of the same issues. So let's look at the one on the left just for a minute. Doesn't that look good? That's fine. I've got the little clips on so that when we go around to multiple areas, it's not going to shift on me. That's a big problem, you know, kind of swinging around and shifting so it jiggles at the end. Well, I can tell you right now that if I start imaging that in six hours, the cells are going to die. Why? through, unfortunately, about six months of trial and error, I discovered that when you put the clips on, it holds down the lids a little too tightly, the CO2 can't get in, the pH changes, and the cells die. Lovely. So I can't leave the dish top on anymore. So I have to take the top off. And in the middle, what I've done is I've taken the top off, and I'm clipped down now to the sides of the well, but I've covered the top with cover, sl uh, cover slips, glass. So that does two things for us. One, glass, hey, good, I can do DIC now, because I couldn't do DIC over there through the plastic, but I can through the glass. These are glass bottom dishes, so it works. Uh, the other thing is if you don't put those cover slips on top, everything evaporates. So that also changes the conditions in the well, and that's a problem. Over on the right, I don't know if you can see it very well, so I'll make it a little bit bigger little water droplets from condensation. And this is oil underneath here. So you got oil and water. They mix really well, don't they? Yeah. So the bubbles from the water kind of went up into the oil and went right in the field of view and everything was lost. So three day experiment out the window. Anyway, bottom line is this. You're watching your cells. Everything looks good. They're looking great. We're at five hours, six hours, seven hours. They're slowing down. Why are they doing that? They still should be pretty good, right? Um, hmm, now they're not moving at all. And uh, whoops, now they're popping off. OK, we're at 17 hours, and they're, they're pretty much dead. Um, now, now comes the fun part. Why? Why did they die? We need to figure out what the issue is. But don't just jump to the conclusion that it was your imaging. Maybe the experiment was they put in a drug to see if it would kill the cells. 
All right, so maybe that's what was supposed to happen. They were supposed to die. The first time this happened to me, I, I was kind of very upset. And I told the, the, uh, the postdoc, and they got very excited. So, you know, it's all your perspective, I guess. Anyway, so take a look at the drug experiment, or the experiment, maybe they were supposed to. Controls, controls, controls. You always need to have controls of whatever type you can think of. You have a separate set of dishes, same conditions, in an incubator outside, and compare that to yours at the end and see if they both did the same thing. All right? Uh, and that will kind of take some of the issues of uh, the imaging out of it. Uh, but the dyes can, as I said, can create problems. The pH from the CO2, temperature fluctuations will create problems. Um, phototoxicity, as I said, reduce the intensity, the number of scans. Uh, your total exposure is really a combination of those, um, of scans and uh, um, intensity. Use the longer wavelengths. Two photon is actually better than confocal, I'll tell you that in a minute, but all of this is compromising and all of this has to be going around and around in your head whenever you make any one of the many um, choices that we're going to have to do. So right now I'm going to give you example number one. I've got three examples to show you. Um, then we'll uh, then you can wake up again, so that should be fine. Three days. So this is a three-day experiment. We're doing a 2D time lapse in three channels. All right. So no stacks involved in this one. So we have in these cells cells with a fluorescent marker for cell cycle. So they're going to be changing from red to green or green to red, depending on how you look at it, as they go through the cell cycle. When they get to green, they're going to be ready to divide. So as you as you follow this in a second, look the, look for the green ones and see what happens next. The, the postdoc wanted to uh, go through two to three cell cycles. They needed to see something. Honestly, I don't even remember what it was. But because it didn't really matter that we looked at the very specifics of the cell cycle, um, we could do longer time intervals. So we're doing 20 minute intervals on these uh, for 71 hours to do that. And that, by doing 20 minute intervals, that lowered the total number of exposures over time. So that helped a lot. Um, we're doing this with a 20x extra long working distance uh, objective with the correction collar so we can adjust for it because these guys are on plastic. These guys are in a six well plate. Um, and we wouldn't be able to do DIC if we wanted to, but my wide field system does, however, have phase contrast, and so that's what we're going to be looking at. Phase plus green plus red. The system autofocus is what we're using for deciding that whether it's going out of focus or not. And what I'm going to show you is only one field out of 20 multipoint areas. So here we go. You'll notice one of the nice things about these cell types is they don't move very much, which is great. They don't, uh, they're staying in the field of view. We can do higher magnifications and we can follow through the process. The main thing to look at is the cells are alive, they're happy, they're dividing normally, uh, everything is good, and the researcher could see what they were looking for in that particular case. As I said, I don't remember what they were looking for, but the imaging worked pretty well. Notice there is a little bit of jiggle from that backlash, but it's really not that bad, and there's actually software that can correct for some of that as well. So, all in all, a good successful experiment right there. Let's take a look at the next one. This is a little bit more challenging, because now we're going to be dealing with 3D. So with 3D data sets, we're dealing generally with confocal or two photon approaches, uh, because both of those will allow us to visually section through our sample. Uh, each plane uh, in, that, in that stack is going to be sharp. It won't have any out of focus light in each plane. The difference between confocal and two photon is that with confocal, you're illuminating the entire volume all of the time, and you're just taking the out of focus light out of the image and just leaving you with the thin slice. But you're exciting everything, you're bleaching everything. Uh, and that's an issue because if you think uh, in that example I had before where it said 70 slices, if I'm starting at the top and going through 70 to the bottom and it's illuminating everything the entire time, by the time I get to the bottom I may have bleached out my entire sample. So you have to take that into consideration. Two photon is nice because it's only illuminating the plane that you're actually looking at. So that's, that's good if you have a setup that can do that. Uh, but either way, what you're doing is making your stack one sharp slice at a time. So the scope that we're using for this uh, is my SP8. This is uh, where we're going to be looking at intracellular morphology and 6D imaging, so dividing cancer cells. So in these cancer cells, what was really important was the point of division. And there's this, uh, there's this thing called LANA that we were looking at. It was marked with an RFP, that's red fluorescent protein. 
and we had a GFP green kind of general marker to see the rest of the cell. We also took a DIC label, although I'm not showing it here just because it doesn't look very good. So we'll go with uh, basically the two channel approaches. These are the issues. We need high magnification because we're looking at division and we're looking intranuclear. We have a very weak signal to deal with, which means we're going to have high noise. And because we're looking at cell division, where our higher intensities are going to kill our cells, we need to make sure the laser intensities stay down. Some of those are pretty mutually exclusive, and that's a bit of a problem. The most important parts about this are actually the 3D information, and I'm going to show you why in a sec, uh, and the temporal resolution, in other words, how fast. Uh, the interval can be with these things. We need to be able to do that. Okay, we're going to be doing a stack through a dividing cell. You need to think ahead, all right? So when you're looking at a cell that's flat and growing around in a dish, it's only about five to seven microns thick, but when it divides, it rounds up. And so these guys are somewhere around 14, 15 microns when they round up. And so that means for the entire sequence, I have to shoot where I think it's going to divide up into, filling the space, only for that uh, short amount of time when it's rounded up. But that's a lot of exposures in empty space during the time that, uh, you know, it's not dividing. Anyway, we're doing half micron steps through uh, um, in 28 slices. All right. We're doing five minute intervals, which honestly is too slow, but for what we needed to do, uh, it was good enough, uh, for 18 hours. Now. Here's where the numbers start really kind of messing with your head. Three channels, 6,076 frames equals 18,228 exposures, which equals 437,472 total scans because each scan is actually six lines of accumulation times four averages uh, in the three channels. That one, this one set, is 4.8 gigabytes, and that's only one out of 20, so the entire experiment was uh, 111 gigabytes. That's one file. All right, wow. You hit save and come go away for an hour. Uh, that's basically one of the other issues, and we're not even going to get into that today. And what I'm showing you next is just actually a small segment. It's, it's not the entire 18 hours. It's just the time that these cells were dividing that I took out of that whole thing. All right, so here's the raw data. Pretty noisy, pretty grainy. You got three cells here, here, and here, and you can see them going through their division. We'll let it go through another cycle in a second. Um, as it goes through there, go that one, that one, and oh, that one down there. Sorry, it divided already. The one in the middle there, that's the one we're going to be following. All right, so this is the raw data, and knowing that I can do deconvolution, knowing that I can do stuff in post-processing was in, uh, instrumental in being able to do what you're going to see next. So taking that image and cleaning it up, we can get it to look like this. And so now we're kind of working with this in a little bit more detail, but we're still looking at it from basically the 2D view, top down looking at it, right? So again, this is the one that we want to look at in a little bit more detail. We are looking down, we're seeing that they're dividing, and that, that sort of ring is what we're interested in. That's inside the nucleus. All right, now we're going to zoom in on that middle one by itself, and I'm going to slow it down a little bit so you can see the process. Right there was the division, and right there you could also see where it pulled apart. But looking at it from the top doesn't really give us the information that we're looking for. In the next slide, you're going to see what really happens in 3D. So we get to that one point at division, you wow. can rotate this, move it around, and you can see the ring structure. That ring structure is what we were trying to figure out. Did it stay a ring as it went through the division? And we're in the process of quantifying that now uh, with some pretty high-end uh, people at Drexel. Uh, anyway, this is uh, one of the more challenging ones to deal with because, as I said, this is true 6D imaging right now and um, we have lots of limitations and we have uh, lots of particular problems and we would really like to get this down to one minute intervals instead of the five, or excuse me, yeah, instead of the five minute intervals, but uh, we still have a few more bugs to work out. If we could get the intensity level higher, that would help. 
All right, the last example I'm gonna show you is uh, this one. This is uh, distribu distribution of a collagen in a 3D matrix. We have one lab that's working on the microenvironment of, uh, of cancer cells, and collagen is a big part of that. And so they wanna be able to quantify, wanna be able to look at what's going on in the three-dimensional process. So we wanna be able to visualize collagen in these things. Now, a couple of problems. Collagen strands are thin. The collagen matrix is thick. That means a lot of slices. Uh, the collagen is also unlabeled. So how are we gonna look at it? So what we do is we use second harmonic generation. And second harmonic, as you re might recall, is, how we, is one of the things we can use with two photon. Second harmonic is essentially autofluorescence. It's a specialized autofluorescence of that particular molecule. So we're gonna use the second harmonic generation with the two photon microscope. That's my two photon on the right. By the way, that's taller than I am if you're trying to figure out how big it is. Mm -hmm. um, this is an upright configuration and we ran into the first problem right away because I'm using this beautiful 25X 1.0 NA objective and they brought me the dish on the left. Yeah, it doesn't fit and I have to dip down into it because it's an upright configuration. So then they brought me a dish and although it goes down into it here, we don't have a lot of lateral movement because the, size, the, the sides were too high. So we used the top of the dish instead and that was the way we were able to set up the collagen matrix so we could look at this stuff. All right, so here's what we're looking at. Looks exciting, doesn't it? Well, not really. This is one slice, and what we're actually gonna do, this is a 200 by 200 micron area. What we really want is a, a Z stack going through 200 additional microns. So what I'm doing now is showing you the 200 slices that I took out of this thing. This is not time lapse, this is a single time point. So 200 microns took about 20 minutes to go down through, um, but it was okay because it wasn't moving in the process. Every single time point looks pretty much the same except for where everything is, but you really get a hard time getting a feel for that in 3D, don't you? Uh, so I was like, okay, this is the raw data. What can I do with it? Well, you can do what's called a maximum projection, bring it all together, and it's kind of like taking that pancake and slapping it down together, and that's what everything looks like. Not too bad, but I still don't get an idea of the depth. So how about we add a little shadowing to it? Well, that doesn't help very much either, but that's okay. Here's what's really going to help. Let's add a color lookup table called color depth coding. And in this case, what you have is the red is the stuff closest to the top, and the blue is the stuff that's farthest away. So this is a way to present 3D data in 2D in a way that you can get an idea of the depth. But what we really want to see is what that looks like in 3D. And so we can take that whole thing wow. and start mm -hmm. playing with it and wow. doing measurements. And this is really going to be fun. So anybody like uh, some? <laughs> Wee! Wow. Isn't that fun? That is cool. And I can make measurements anywhere within that. Anyway, all of this is rather mind-blowing. Uh, and so I think at this point, I'm going to go maybe dunk my head something like that. I don't know. Um, but thank you for your attention. As I said, this is a very complicated process, and I just gave you a little flavor for it right now. Anyway, thank you again. Thank you, Jim.